The end of Mark chapter 8 is the exact halfway point of Mark's 16 chapter gospel, which means that all the action in the first half of Mark's gospel is leading up to today's scripture reading. If this were a play, today's passage would be the act one finale, building suspense and offering foreshadowing for what is to come in the second act of the story of Jesus. And it's here that Mark, the great screenwriter and storyteller, leaves the disciples hanging with this ominous saying from Jesus, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. There it is, the word cross. It's the central symbol of the Christian faith and the hallmark of Mark's gospel. He uses that word cross more than any other gospel writer, but this is the first time it's mentioned in Mark. And Jesus waits until now, at the halfway point of his ministry, to mention anything about the cross for the first time. And notice, Jesus is not just referring to himself. He's not just saying, look, fellas, we have to head down to Jerusalem now because there is a cross awaiting me there. It would be hard enough for the disciples to understand that. Instead, he says something even more difficult. He says, there is a cross for you, too. If you want to follow me, there is a cross for you to carry as well. I guess we can understand why Jesus waited until now to mention it. I mean, could you imagine how different the beginning of Mark's gospel would have sounded? You know, back when Jesus was first calling the disciples? Mark 1, 17, then Jesus called the disciples and said, follow me and I will make you fishers of people and you will experience persecution and hardship in the form of a cross. Y you guys with me? Anyone? I'm not so sure they would have said yes. Imagine a local church redesigning its website to attract new visitors. And instead of website headlines that read, excellent children's ministry, ample parking, inspiring music, seven steps to a more joyful life. What if it read, join us and discover sacrifice, struggle and hardship? How many clicks do you think that website would get? Or imagine a church putting a banner on its front door that reads, join us and suffer. How well would that go? Frankly, it's a wonder that the disciples even decided to keep following Jesus at that point. I mean, we wouldn't blame them if they had deserted him halfway through his ministry. Because there was no mistaking what Jesus was saying to them. If you want to follow Jesus, your cross is unavoidable. It is about losing what you value the most to gain what you do not understand. And then he asks this question, one of the most poignant ones in the entire gospel. For what value is it if a person were to gain the whole world but lose their life? Honestly, if it were you and I standing in the disciples' sandals that day, we would have seriously considered walking away right then and there. Imagine our response, wait a minute, Jesus, are you saying this isn't about me? This isn't about meeting my needs? Are you saying this isn't about making me feel good or helping me feel powerful or happy or successful? What? It's a wonder why anyone would bother to stick with him, given all the temptations in the culture to give us those very things. It really does beg the question of you and me this morning, why bother following Jesus at all? Well, Mark offers some important answers to that question. One answer has to do with that important word, life. For what value is it if a person were to gain the whole world but lose their life? That word for life is one of the most important Greek words in the whole gospel. It is often translated as soul but it doesn't just refer to what happens to us after we die. Here it is translated as life, but it means so much more than just being alive. The word for life is the Greek word suke, the same root that gives us psyche, like psychology. It's related to the word for breath. 
The Greeks understood suke as the very essence of our being, the, the animating force that makes us truly and fully alive. It's what makes us sentient and self-aware and rational and emotional and is the seat of all we dream of and desire. That's the kind of life Jesus meant when he said in John 10.10 10, that he has come to give us life more abundantly. And it's here, halfway through Mark's gospel, that Jesus tells it to them straight. If you want that kind of life, you have to go through the cross. But here's the other intriguing possibility as to why Jesus waited until now to mention anything about the cross to the disciples. Maybe Jesus knew that spiritual maturity is not instantaneous. It is not a quick fix. It's... It's a process that requires a lifetime of small steps with each one capable of more stretching and growing than the one before. It's what Friedrich Nietzsche called the long obedience in the same direction. Nietzsche said, the essential thing in heaven and earth is that there should be a long obedience in the same direction. There thereby results and has always resulted in the long run, he said, something which has made life worth living. What Jesus is saying to us today is that to gain the kind of life that God intends for us requires a series of losses, not all at once, not all at the beginning of our lives or at the beginning of our spiritual journey, not, not in chapter one of our lives. That would make it too easy to walk away from God. But God is there to guide us through one necessary hardship after another all for the sake of learning to trust in God more and more and to learn to rely on our own agendas less and less. If it's true that with age comes wisdom, maybe it's also true that maturity comes through hardship. I think we know this intuitively, right, based on basic life experience. We learn some of our most important lessons later in life, not when we're adolescents or teenagers, Sometimes it's not until later in adulthood, as we approach the, the halfway point of life, the, the Mark chapter 8 of our own lives, when we can stretch without breaking and grow up without giving up. We learn the value of loyalty by experiencing the sting of betrayal. We learn about long-term commitment after we go through heartbreak. We learn how to spot sincerity in others only by experiencing dishonesty. We learn the power of grace when we can learn from our biggest mistakes. We learn how to forgive when we are wounded more than we thought we could bear. We discover the limits of both flattery and criticism only when we learn the hard way not to believe our own press. These are lessons that take time to learn. These are crosses that we learn to bear only when we're ready. We can't learn all of these things when we're young, when we, when we aren't strong enough, when we aren't able to be stretched without breaking. These hard lessons come across a lifelong process as a series of losses in moments when we can handle them. In that way, suffering can offer us a gift of increasing our capacity to hold pain so that we can grow from it and help others to endure. Yet Mark would remind us of one more very important truth. It is not just any suffering that can lead to true life. It is losing one's life, quote, for Christ's sake, that one can gain their life. As important as it is to learn all those other life lessons through hardship, it is even more important to mature in one's faith by taking up one's cross and learning to let go of everything else. Maybe a bit like the song by Alison Krauss, everyone wants to go to heaven, but no one wants to die. Well, we may want the kind of life that God intends for us, but we may not want to let go of that which is necessary to let go of in order to attain it. What parts of you need to die today? What cross do you need to carry? Is it your desire for greatness or power or position or possession you can't be a disciple of Jesus while you're constantly measuring your greatness against your neighbors. 
Is it your need to wipe out your enemies rather than seeking reconciliation or forgiveness or peacemaking? Following Jesus is about a a steady, determined march of self-giving love. And with each step, we pour out ourselves for others. It could be that in order to increase our capacity to love God and others, we have to name our blind spots before others, to name our biases, our prejudices, and the work of anti-racism within ourselves. Maybe, Maybe we need to let go of the kinds of political and ideological filters that prevent us from seeing the truth of injustice through the eyes of the gospel. Maybe those are the things that have to die in order to recognize the ways that we are part of the problem in order to be part of the solution. Maybe what needs to die is your sinful self, a part of your life that Augustine defines as your heart turned inward upon itself. It could be that ultimately you need to stop making everything about you and start living out God's purposes and God's best intentions for your life. These are hard lessons, friends. And I suppose that if Jesus had come to you at the very beginning of your spiritual journey, back in the first chapter of Mark's story of your life, you probably wouldn't have said yes. And you would be like many, many other people who have chosen to walk away from Jesus and the church and the faith entirely. But Jesus comes to you right now with these hard questions at just the right time, because you are now ready to answer them. You are now able to let go of those parts of yourself in order to gain the kind of life that God has always intended for you. Jesus said, for those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. And he is asking you and me this question today. What will it profit you to gain the whole world but forfeit your life? The answer is up to you. Let's pray. God of grace and love, you are with us now on our spiritual journeys, calling us forward toward a life that you intend for us. Give us the strength to give up the parts of ourselves that need to die so that we can take up the cross that is meant for us to carry. We wish to lose ourselves in surrender in order to gain true life in abundance. We pray these things in the name of Jesus and by the strength of Christ alone. Amen.